Pocock, I'm the chair of the independent inquiry into the Sheffield street tree dispute. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, could you please tell us your name and your role? Sure. Um, my name's uh, Andy Milner. I'm the former chief executive of AMI. Fine. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, and um, just to run through a couple of things um, so everybody understands the base on which we're talking. This is being uh, web streamed, live streamed and recorded and be made available to people afterwards. I think you're aware sure. of that. And we also have to be careful that we don't inadvertently say anything in, in our discussion which would be defamatory or libelous or we'll bring into the public domain private information about somebody which isn't in the public domain which they're entitled to have protected. And I think you understand that. Of course, yeah. Okay, great. So, um, is there anything you would like to say by way of introductory remarks before we start working our way through the list of topics that I've sent you in advance? Sure, perhaps, perhaps I can introduce myself a little bit further Please do. and then and I do have a few um, opening remarks if that's okay. So, Please do. Um, I say I'm an owner, I'm a chartered civil engineer, I have um, 30 years experience in uh, the design, construction, maintenance and operation of infrastructure um, all, all across the UK and, and in a number of different sectors. Um, I spent 22 years working for AME in one form or another. Uh, I originally joined a business called Lloyd Williams Consulting Engineers in Sheffield. Uh, that business was acquired uh, by AME. I joined the Executive Committee of AME in 2008 as a Managing Director and undertook various Managing Director roles until uh, the end of 2015 when I became the Group Chief Executive and uh, joined the Board uh, of AME. Uh, I left the business in, um, at the end of 2019. For the last two years I've been working with uh, an investor group to acquire AMI from its current parent um, Grupo Frobial. That deal is complete and signed and will close in the coming days, at which point I will go back to AMI as the Chief Executive. That's in the public domain, um, but I, I wanted to make you aware of that as well. Thank you very much indeed. Um, is there anything else you want to sure. uh, tell me about the basis on which you're talking today or any other introductory remarks you'd like to yeah, make? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so I was involved in the street side contract since, well, from the beginning. Um, I've not had a huge amount of access to documentation. Uh, I'm not today an AMI employee, but I do um, have the permission of AMI to speak freely. And I, I would like to make a few open remarks on that, on that basis. Um, AMI is a, a large business with national operations across a range of different sectors. Um, at the time it also had an international component, so a very large complex business. Um, but it's a business that's very proud of what it does and the impact that that has on society and communities. Sheffield contract was and is extremely important to AMI uh, and we saw it as a significant opportunity to, to upgrade um, the underperforming and underinvested highway network and provide the high quality of infrastructure that the, um, that the city deserves. We, we are genuinely and were genuinely motivated by this, particularly those of us that live in Sheffield. Uh, this was an opportunity to deploy our technical skills uh, and to use our PFI and project finance experience. And, and we are one of only a, a very small number of organisations in the UK that can, that can do that. But we were also keen to welcome many new colleagues um, into AMI through the TUPE transfer process from the Council and support the development of their careers in AMI and in Sheffield. A AMI today remains rightly proud of the work it has done to deliver the investment in the city over the past 10 years and of its ongoing operation and, and maintenance. At the time of tender, we didn't see the, um, or foresee the depth of resistance to the tree replacement programme. And from the outset, uh, I, I would reiterate, uh, reiterate what Darren um, uh, explained last week, that the performance of the contract was weighted heavily towards the hard estate, the carriageways and footways, particularly during the core investment periods. And trees were considered in coincidence with that, uh, with that asset but the central criteria of performance was dominated by footways, carriageways and of course of street lighting replacement. We did understand the arguments put forward but, um, for retain, retaining the trees by the campaigners, um, but we also um, 
recognised that the subject of tree replacement divided opinion in the city. Um, and we explored, uh, as you know, um, alternatives, physical alternatives to the tree replacement programme um, that would perhaps enable the retention of trees. But I'm sure, as we will discuss, we were locked into a, a very rigid contract. And in continuing the works, our principal consideration was for the safety and well-being of our employees, subcontractors and members of the public. We have a hugely motivated and diligent team working on the contract and I place a lot of trust in their knowledge, professionalism and commitment. I was very proud of the way our team conducted itself during um, the, the period in question in what were quite adverse and, and, and very unusual circumstances. There are significant lessons um, to learn for all parties and I'm very happy to discuss openly uh, the, the events and the actions that took place. There are a few points I would make, maybe four points I would make um, up front that I consider to be critical factors. First of all, the rigidity of the contract, particularly during the core investment period. Um, secondly, the effectiveness of transferring protests to risk to the private sector in a highway environment. Third, the sequencing of the works and how we sequence the works and the way in which that interface with the communication plan and, and finally the design specification, um, how we looked at or how the contract looked at um, the highway asset, the hard estate and the soft estate in conjunction with each other. Okay, well thank you very much indeed. That's an extremely helpful opening um, set of remarks and we will explore some of those issues um, a bit more. And I, let me just say, I, I recognise you've been away from all this for a while and you haven't had a chance to look at every document that's available inside Amy and you're relying to some degree on, on what you remember, although you have had a chance to have some discussions. I know you've made some notes and prepared, but, yeah. but, 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 but I understand the caveat of that. Right. Um, so, let, let me just start, if I may, with a kind of open question, asking you to develop a little bit more perhaps what you, you said in your, your remarks just now, to give you a chance to say more about what, with the benefit of hindsight, you now think might have been done differently in the design stage. Sure. Well, I think, look, I think that was a very critical stage for things to be done differently. I think once you're locked into these contracts, it's difficult to, um, to, to roll out of them, to, to backpedal out of them. Um, but at the design stage, I think there are a number of things that, that could have been looked at differently. The, fir the, the first is, as I mentioned, the scope and asset, asset priority. Um, Amy is experiencing this work and able to fully assess the um, requirement for the work, both in terms of the ongoing operation maintenance and the core investment period. But, but as I said earlier, the, 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 very, the very clear focus on the, in the core investment period was the upgrade of the carriageways and footways um, and, and the associated assets, drainage, gullies, um, you know, curbs, uh, and of course the street lighting uh, replacement. From, from a, an asset perspective, that dominated, and, and trees were considered within that context. So where trees were to be replaced, there was a criteria for doing that, and one of those criteria was damage, damage to the hard asset. Um, I think in in an alternative scenario looking backwards and now taking into account all the, all the things around climate change and biodiversity which is much more prevalent now than it was in you know, the, the, um, the early 2000s, um, it would be possible at least to reclassify the damage criteria into perhaps major and minor or potential major and minor and then make some adjustments to the way in which you consider the work needed to be done and the, and the measurement of performance on the work needed to be done to the hard asset, to the highways, um, to the carriageways and, uh, and footways, and, and consider with greater parity um, trees as an asset. That would be possible, but it wasn't how the contract looked at um, th those assets at the time. Um, and, the, and, I, and I guess the other point, and I'm not an expert in this, is that um, there was a, a real intent to replace uh, those trees which had not been invested in or, or maintained or looked after or perhaps were considered to be <coughs> inappropriate with more appropriate species and that also is something that perhaps could have been looked at now in a slightly different context. Um, 
I think the second point, and this is really, really important, is, is the whether we could build in greater flexibility in, into the contract. These are 25-year contracts. Um, and it kind of exacerbated by the fact that you're applying rigid contractual uh, conditions to a live asset. Um, you know, this is a live highway network. People live on that network. Trees grow on, on the network. Vehicles move on that network. So it's extremely hard to, um, to fix at any moment in time the, the scope and the nature of the work. Um, that's quite different from a PFI to build a school in a green field where you've got absolute control over the, over the site during the in investment period, during the construction period. Um, and in this contract there are kind of five parties to consider. It's not, it's not just Amy and the council. Um, you know, this is underpinned by government credits. We have a, a lender group. We form an SPV with, with other parties. There's Amy LG. Um, and all of the activities of AMLG are guaranteed by the AMI group, so there's a direct connection between um, ALG and the, uh, and the AMI group. There are also then processes which are in themselves quite rigid, so the achievement of CIP is uh, based on the achievement of milestones which are certified by an independent certifier, so it, it's not the case that you know, Amy or the council could just ignore a particular piece of asset that, um, that hadn't been upgraded. Um, that is assessed by an independent certifier and certified as either complete or, 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 not, or not complete. Um, and each of these investments, the investments put forward by the council, by the government and by, um, and, and by the lenders, um, has a business case and it has been signed off and agreed uh, based on a, on a business case. PFIs are um, sort of underpinned by the concept of risk transfer from the public to the, um, to the private sector and unwinding that risk transfer can unwind the entire contract um, and the consequences of that are, are very significant. And finally, there's a, there's a further level of perhaps in, inherent inflexibility uh, that comes about because these were, uh, this is a contract that was procured publicly to European procurement rules and will be subject to challenge if there were major changes. But having said all that, at the design stage, if we've been able to take into account or, or the, the development of the contract was able to take into account the live nature and the potential for things changing over a long period of time, then we could potentially build in a mechanism that would accommodate things as they arose as, as opposed to being locked into a very rigid <coughs> process. And maybe that's a job for you know, lawyers and, and, and experts in contract, but I think you know, there are lots of reasons why PFI and project finance PPP type contracts would benefit from a greater level of flexibility. Um, the third point, I think, at the uh, design stage would be a per perhaps more clear focus on what risk you can appropriately transfer. And, and the obvious one, when, when I look back at this, is the transferring um, the, the risk, of the, the protester risk from the, from the highway authority to, um, to the private sector. In reality, um, the council can't um, transfer its highway responsibilities, its highway authority responsibilities. I, I, I don't think there's any legal way of doing that. So that leaves the, um, uh, the aim in this case with a risk that it's not actually best place to, to manage. And I think at the design stage, if, if we were being able to take a more um, focused or, or detailed review of risks and, and what the transfer of those risks actu actually meant when something happened, not just what it, what it was to actually do it in, in a contract, I think we might have found a different solution to, the, to, to managing the, the, um, uh, the protester risk. That wouldn't necessarily, that wouldn't have um, removed the fact that there was going to be a campaign of trees, but it would have perhaps helped uh, in, in the way in which it was managed. The, the, I think perhaps more on now from, from Amy's perspective is um, around the way the work was, was scheduled. Um, we were very conscious that, uh, that, that the council were, were focused on congestion reduction and minimising the impact that the works, particularly during the core investment period, had uh, on the city and, on, uh, and on, on the areas around the city. 
that I think, you know, having um, spent all my life living here, came from um, a bad experience during the construction of Sheffield Super Tram, where you know, yeah. there was huge impact on the um, on the city, and it was very clear, you know, all the way back at pretender that, that that was a clear objective. Our, our response to that was to plan the works, the CIP works in zones, um, with the idea being that you would complete the majority of the works required for the core investment period in, in one visit, not, not, not in one day, but in one period. And so you wouldn't get this idea of repeat visits where you've done the you know, softer stay and then you go back and do street lives. And so you get this long, prolonged disruption in a particular region. So the, the zonal um, approach was something that we were really keen on um, implementing because we thought it would reduce congestion. Um, we started in the north of the city um, and that there was no reason for that other than they were perhaps a lower congested area so it was a sensible place to start and the works uh, as we were sort of mobilising the contract that you know the, the works were perhaps easier to, to deliver in that in those areas <coughs> and it was some time before we arrived towards the west and the southwest of the city where we where we found you know the sort of uh, strength of feeling around the, the tree replacement um, the way that the communications worked is that they were quite um, close to actually starting the work so it was some time before the communications in the west and the southwest of the city took place about the actual works that were, going to, that were going to happen and I do wonder that if that communication had been much earlier about the whole programme city wide programme and maybe with you know hindsight with greater visualisation of what the impact of those works would be you know with 3D modelling and the ability we've got now with technology we may have been able to then see the potential strength of feeling that would um, was going to arise and were that then the case, perhaps you could make a change across the whole of the contract, not just the, uh, not when you were so, so far, uh, you know, developed on the contract, so far down the road of progress that making a change would kind of uh, unwind where they were they'd already been done, perhaps give a, a wider perspective on that. So I think the work scheduling has got quite a bit um, um, that we could have done perhaps differently at the design stage. So the four things I would review. Again, extremely helpful. Thank you very much. Let me just explore one or two sure. elements of what you just said. Um, you, um, you're clear that protester risk was something Amy was taking on under the contract. Yeah. You probably um, saw the conversation, I guess, I had with Darren Butt and Peter Anderson. Yeah. And one of the questions I was asking them to speak to is, what could have been done differently that might have exposed the fact that it, it turned out there was a degree of protester risk. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to say about that? <coughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I think when you when you're looking at um, protesters in in an in an urban environment on contracts like this, then we would inevitably draw on our experience of undertaking similar works in similar cities, and we've not come across anything like what what we what we saw here. There have been isolated you know, incidents in particular locations where people uh, don't like the work that have been undertaken and have to deal with that, but we've never seen anything like the sort of more widespread um, uh, dissatisfaction with, 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 with what was happening. So at, at the time of tender, we didn't, we didn't foresee that. I think the only way um, to have un unearthed that would have been to have a much wider and more detailed consultation mm -hmm. with, with much clearer depiction of what was actually going to happen right. um, and, and clearly that didn't uh, happen pre, uh, you know, before we started the work so, and although I'm sure there was a level of consultation the message didn't land because I think people involved in the tree campaign would have made it very clear what their feelings mm -hmm. were about that at, the, at that stage. Yeah, okay. So essentially you're recognising that it's possible at least, conceivable, that had different people been asked different questions, yeah. this risk may have been, been clearer. That relates to something else I asked um, Peter Anderson, I think, which is um, a number of people from different perspectives have said to me that they told people from Amy in mid-2012, around the time the contract was signed, that the approach to street trees in parts of the city was going to run into problems and um, 
those people feel that their concerns were not taken seriously. Is there any comment you'd like to make on that? Uh, I, I, I have no recollection of that, and I, 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 and I, you know, I live here as well, so I didn't, I don't have any recollection of that from um, conversations outside of um, the workplace, and, and certainly not informed from from the workplace. Okay, fine. Um, <clears throat> so let's move on to some of the things that then arose during the course of the uh, the dispute, and let's perhaps start on on the issue of what happened on Rustlings Road in November. Um, 2016 and some of my questions around this are about the way those kind of issues would have percolated up to you yeah. then the CEO yeah. and um, the board and the nature of the discussions that you yeah. would have had so so could you from what you remember tell us sort of conversations you had with senior streets ahead staff and others about the operation and its aftermath um, I think we were sort of recognising um, some escalation in resistance by by that time. Um, I, I don't think we fully understood the depth and strength of that resistance, and and I think personally, I you know I felt that was a very localized issue. That, you know, the, the trees on Muslim Road were, were um, focused on by by a small number of people, and perhaps once the operation had been completed, then then that would be the end of that, and we could get we could get on with um, um, with business. Um, we were confident, and, and what, when we sort of learned of, of the plans, we were comf we checked and we triangulated with our internal legal team and uh, later our external legal team, health and safety, um, and the council, and we were confident that we were legally able to conduct the works in that way. Um, our priority, and throughout all of these conversations, I think our priority has been very clear that the health and safety and well-being and protection of our people was paramount, so undertaking the works when there was no one around early in the morning definitely had the effect of protecting just protecting our people. But, I mean, it is, it is very clear that it didn't have the impact that we wanted. It actually probably had the opposite impact and galvanised um, um, the concern of the, uh, the tree campaigners and, and, and probably stoke the, stoke the fire. Um, and so at the board level we did talk about that, we started the conversations about is this going to be a bigger problem and, and what can we do about it. Um, and I think, it's, I think it is important perhaps, and it may be a slight digression here, but, but to, to give you some perspective of, um, of, of what we were talking about at, at, at the board level. Um, I, I guess I guess one of the one of the questions might be, well, well, why did you just not refuse to do the work? You know, if, if you knew this was going to be reputationally damaging or something, why why would you just not not do that? And and the and the first response is, as sort of directors, we have a, you know, our duty is to do what's in the best interest of the company. Um, and when you sort of evaluate all of the options, really not doing the work, not completing the work that we were, were obliged to do is not a sensible option. This is a contract, as, as I know you've explored, that has significant penalties for um, the performance of the asset, for not achieving the performance of the asset. But in particular, during, um, uh, during the core investment period, there are further penalties for not achieving the milestones, and there's a, a further penal penalties for not achieving the core investment period. And that becomes structural. That you know, becomes a real a real problem, and if, if that goes to its extreme and the the whole house of cards collapses, then the liabilities in that situation are absolutely enormous, irrespective of where they end up. They are enormous. So when you when you're evaluating all of the consequences of not doing something, you have to take into consideration all of the consequences of doing it and what you are trying to to protect. And so they, that that was a very significant. Uh, consideration for me and for um, the directors of the company at, at that time. Okay, thank you. Uh, my understanding is that um, you had a conversation with Nick Clegg yeah. shortly after the Rustings Road operation. Yeah. Could you tell us, what, what, what can you tell me about that conversation? Um, I don't have a record of it and, and, and I, I don't know if um, 
But you have a memory of that, place. yes? No, I, I, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I remember of it, but I, I haven't been able to refer to any letter or anything like that. So um, I was asked to go and see Nick Clegg, um, and, and I was happy to, happy to do that. Um, as I remember, Nick had actually been supportive of the PFI and, and, and supporting um, obtaining the credits for the PFI. Um, he was um, very interested in, in why we were taking um, an approach that replaced the trees, um, often trees that were causing quite minimal damage. And, and I was able to explain, you know, looking at the specification and the requirements, what, why, why that was the case. Um, he was also very interested in what econ where economically we stood. So, mm -hmm. did we was it, you know, economically beneficial to remove? And replace trees, or was it? You know, <coughs> and he was surprised actually that it cost us more money to replace the trees than it, than it did to, to leave them in. But I also explained um, what I've just explained I think the sort of constraints and the inflexibility of the contracts and, and the um, problems with escalating any, uh, any uh, issues in not delivering the obligations of the contract. And, and I think he completely understood that. So his encouragement was to try and find a resolution to that problem, uh, not to just cease the works and, and walk away, but actually to try and find a way to um, resolve that problem, but recognising it was a very thorny and difficult issue. Okay, so I'll come back to um, how that then played out shortly. Um, <coughs> what happened after that, um, during the course of 2017 up to early 2018, was essentially an escalation. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered if you could describe for me how, over that extended period, you engaged um, you know, your colleagues at the top of the company and the board in discussions um, with the intent or towards the direction of finding some solutions. How was the top of the company engaged in that process? Uh, so, uh, I mean, as a chief executive, I spent a lot of time with the, with, with the team. Um, particularly with the managing director of um, the highways business, as it was at the time, and he had, a, you know, a, a spent a lot of time with um, with Darren and, and, and his team, and I spent a, a, a lot of time with Darren and his team, and we and we looked in detail at what what was happening, um, what pressures we were under. We took soundings, significant soundings from that team about the clients and Sheffield's uh, view on on where we were. It was very clear that. Um, that Sheffield's intent was to deliver the obligations and, and the outputs of the contract, and, and that really didn't change. You know, that was clear to me in conversations with the senior leadership of the council as well. Um, and I think the other the other point to, to to note on that is that this was a public-private partnership. We were in partnership with uh, with the council, and uh, and the outputs and the outcomes of much of the um, the, the wider parts of the PFI. You know, the, the, the beneficial improvements to the highway network come from that, that partnership. But it was, um, so was, you, taking the information that uh, was provided from the contract team, we then able again to triangulate that with our legal team, our internal legal team and external um, legal support, again with our health and safety uh, team, but also increasingly actually with our um, HR and wellbeing mm -hmm. um, um, Expertise, because we were, you know, really starting to see the stress and the anxiety that um, this situation was causing mm -hmm. from people who were, you know, just expecting to go and do their, their job every day. Um, and so, our, our decisions really at the senior level in the organisation were about providing further support, as much support as we could, to the operational team in, in what was a very clear path that had been that had been set. Okay. Um, so we'll come back, to, I mean, we might come back to some of that, but let's, let's move on to um, the um, discussions you had or engagement you had internally and externally around the um, decision the council took uh, in 2017 to take out the injunction and then subsequent committal um, proceedings. What, could you just um, remind me what your basic view of that strategy was? Um, look, on the basis that we were continuing to do the works, I was um, supportive and to some extent a little bit relieved that we were going to provide a legal framework um, with, with which to be able to conduct those works and to provide 
greater strength, if you like, to the safety zones that we were putting in place. So, you know, safety zones have been established. They started with, you know, plastic barriers. We then gone to heritage fencing, um, but we weren't finding that that was actually deterring people from entering the zones and, and, and stopping the works. So, um, when when we were when I understood that there was a potential legal route which which pro provided those safety zones as an area that that if you were to enter them would be in breach of an injunction. I thought that might be a, a sensible deterrent um, for people wanting to enter those zones. Um, and I guess inevitably in a situation like that, th there needs to be some evidence that you're going to carry on, carry, you know, carry through um, to its logical conclusion what a breach of that injunction would mean. So it was inevitable and logical and, and obvious that we would um, proceed to committal hearings of some of those people. Um, it, it, it wasn't in Amy's power to be able to um, put that injunction in place. Um, we, we're not the highway authority. It had to be done by Sheffield City Council and I guess to some extent in partnership because we did fund um, the legal costs of, of that um, with particular reference I guess to Clause 19, the protester Successor clause, um, and we did provide evidence then of people breaching the uh, breaching the injunction, entering the safety zone. So that was kind of our, um, you know, the extent of our thinking around it, my thinking around that. Um, in the event, you know, the campaigners were ingenious and determined, so mm. to some extent they were uh, less concerned about the breaching the injunction. To, on, on another side of it, they just found other ways to stop right. us by, you know. So I just want to go back to the beginning of what you said because I've had evidence from the company to the effect that the company was sceptical about the, the idea of taking out the injunction and I, uh, they told me in a, in a you know, documentary evidence mm -hmm. that they thought it would be better to try other solutions but from what you've just said that's not quite your memory. Um, I'm, no, I don't. I mean, look, I'm sure there were other solutions that we were contemplating. Um, there were always lots of different solutions that we were we were contemplating. My memory is that we were very much locked into the delivery of this um, of these obligations, particularly for CIP. Yeah. Um, I always felt more comfortable if I was confident that we were acting on the right side of the law and with the support of the law. So, I, you know, I I was. Um, comfortable with um, with pursuing the, in, the injunction. Okay. Um, the reason I ask this is because by this stage, at, at the second quarter of 2017, the campaigners had already demonstrated quite a lot of creativity yeah. and resilience and determination. And so the question arises as to why those advocating this course of action thought it would be effective in deterring the campaigners. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think there's a difference in between entering a safety zone with no consequences and entering a safety zone which may then see you in court and, and with a fine. And it was the kind of legal escalation that I think we thought may be the, the, the deterrent. And I'm sure to some extent it was a deterrent to some people, but not to everybody. Um, and also it, it perhaps encouraged more of the creativity that we talked mm. about. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, okay, um, let's move on again then. And I, I, I as you know, I asked um, Darren some questions about the nature and tone, if you like, of some of the discussions that he was involved with with the political leadership of the council in the most tense period, and mm. also with the executive leadership of the council. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you because I know you had discussions mm. with the same people essentially. I wanted to yeah. ask you if you could give us a description of the sort of tone and nature of some of those discussions? Yeah, and uh, you know, I think the tension was actually with Darren and, and, the, and his conversations because the, uh, the, the conversations <coughs> I had with the Chief Executive were always cordial, they were always constructive, they were focused I and mean, there was no deviation from what Darren was telling me and, and, what, and what the Chief Executive was, was telling me. Um, I had one meeting with the leader of the council and that was the same, it was, it was cordial um, and I think maybe a couple of meetings with, um, with Brian Lodge and, it, and again, you know, cordial, constructive. There was never any 
they were never forceful or difficult conversations. They were complex, but they were constructive. But I do recognise what Darren's saying that they were, you know, perhaps more robust um, on a day-to-day basis. Okay. Um, the let's talk about um, the the way the core investment period and its milestones affected things. Um, just could you just describe again for me? Um, how the achievement of the core investment period milestones was so important and what was different before the achievement of those and after the achievement of those. Okay. Um, so, yeah, let me try and frame this the right way. The right way. So, any PFI has got a capital phase, a, a, a capital phase, and, you, and, and at that point you do, you're deploying the money that's been injected by the by the lenders, um, and the intention is to achieve something at the end of that phase, um, so that could be a new school or a hospital, in this case it was the upgrade of the, uh, of the highway network, and there are particular measures along the way um, which are agreed pre-tender um, as to whether that is being achieved, and they are the milestones. As you compl- and in this case, as you completed certain zones, then you can see the condition indices of the pavements and, and carriageways um, uh, in general increasing. Um, and I think CIP was different for street lights. I think that was kind of a, a separate core investment period, but, but the rest of it was focused mainly on footways and, um, uh, and carriageways, let's say. So um, as you achieve milestones to a programme, the unitary charge, which right. is paid by the council, steps up yeah. into an eventual um, sort of ceiling, yeah. which, is, which then is sufficient to be able to pay the ongoing operational costs of maintaining the highway um, and to make the debt service repayments back to uh, back to the lenders over the um, o- over the course of the um, of the remaining contract. Not achieving um, milestones brings with it sort of you know, issues in respect of the, the lower level of uh, UC um, impacts on you know the cash paid out to yeah. um, to the service provider um, but it, there is flexibility ultimately to catch that up as long as it, it is caught up not achieving the core investment period period, period um, outputs in its entirety is a much bigger issue because you've then not actually um, fulfilled the obligations of the PFI mm. what you're actually doing is just completing the operation and maintenance activities that, that could have been outsourced in a, in, a, in a different way. And the contract has many different ways of then dealing with the you know, failure to achieve CIP um, and many different ways of assessing the reason for that. But the consequences of that are, 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 are pretty dire. Yes. So It's a really big problem, if I can summarise in layperson's terms, it's a really big problem if you're um, significantly derailed or prevented from achieving the CIP milestones. But once you get to the other side of that, the the issues are somewhat different because you've unlocked the whole of the unitary charge, regular payments, and um, you've you've cleared a significant hurdle. Would that be, have I understood that correctly? Yeah. Um, and, And you're then into a different... Phase so the the kind of if, if you like the, the core investment period ends, but it kind of does carry on because you have to maintain that you have to maintain the asset at that, at that condition, and and the, and the asset will continue to deteriorate. So you have to make in the interventions, which are called life cycle yeah. interventions, and they are additional schemes that will happen throughout the life of the contract. And that runs along alongside the operation and maintenance, which has been yeah. underway from from day one of the contract. But yeah, okay. achieving CIP is a significant. It's a, it's a big deal. Okay, very good. And uh, as as Darren told me, um, the CIP milestones were basically achieved other than for street lines <coughs> by the end of December 2017. Yeah. <coughs> now, um, <coughs> the reason I want to get into this is because. On the basis of the argument you've made, after December 2017, the set of pressures and risks facing the company were somewhat different. And indeed, um, pretty quickly after that, um, as again Darren said in the documentation, 
demonstrates, um, Amy started to offer, at its own expense, to take a different approach to dealing with some of the controversial trees, basically to take on some of the costs of allowing fewer trees to be removed. Um, have I understood all that? You, you, that's your understanding as well? Uh, I'm, I'm, happy that, that I'm happy that that's correct, yeah. I'm right. Happy, uh, that's right. Um, now, um, Amy, by the beginning of February, the council believed, were willing to finance yourselves more of that kind of work which would reduce the number of trees that needed still yeah. to be removed, the controversial trees. Um, it's, so the question that arises is why it nevertheless took until the 26th of March, by which time there'd been very severe escalations, for um, Amy to do what Darren told me he took the decision to do on the 26th of March, which is basically to, to pull the plug on the, um, by then, failing attempts to remove more trees. Because, um, and, and Peter and Darren both said to me, in retrospect, that decision should have been taken earlier. Um, and indeed, Amy had, had put the offer to the council on the by the beginning of February. The council believed that offer was available to them by the beginning of February. Now, a lot of a lot of difficult things happened between the beginning of February and the end of March. So, the, I just want to check whether you would you would sort of agree with what Darren and Peter said that, in retrospect, that decision that was taken on the 26th of March could have been taken you know, uh, a good degree earlier and, and, and it would follow that some of the things that happened between the beginning of February and the end of 26th of March would then not have happened. Yeah, I mean, I think, you, I think it would be... Um, to, to draw a firm conclusion on that point, I think it's important to get the, <coughs> the Council's view on, on, on all of that as well. Um, I think we were <coughs> trying to fulfil the obligations of the wider contract and, and obviously those obligations continue outside of CIP uh, uh, as we've talked about and, and there were escalations and each time there was an escalation we were hoping that that escalation would work and it was clear at the time that you're talking now that those escalations weren't working so mm -hmm. here we got to a point where, um, where we did ask for, um, ask for a pause and at that point, the council were prepared to accept um, that pause. Uh, you see, I'd wondered whether what you were going to say was something else that has come across from earlier evidence, which is um, the financial risks you faced were lower because you got to the end of the CIP. That's why you're willing to make your offer. But you were still under significant pressure from the council being exercised through the attempt to use performance penalties um, that you were paying significant sums out over that period uh, against, that, that that was one of the pressures that you were having to juggle. But you've not said that so far. Well, that, I mean, that's been said by others. Right? And, and, fair enough. And, okay. and, and the, the kind of the point, and, and so yes, I mean, that, that is you know, kind of a matter of record, you, know, you can see that. Um, and, and the point, actually, that I, I am trying to make is I think there were wider consequences as well for not completing the obligations of the, um, of the contract and, and that they were the consequences perhaps that the, that the board was preoccupied with um, around maybe defaulting on the contract or, or not completing elements of it and what that, it, what the impact would have, would have had, what impact that would have had um, on the contract overall. Against which you were also weighing the impact of of uh, damage to the company's reputation by being engaged in this and the kind of higher level political um, messages you were getting. Could you tell us a bit more about those things? Uh, well, I mean, it's very much what I, what I said earlier, you know, um, even post CIP, the, the, conse the, if the consequences of not delivering on the obligations, of persistently not achieving the service standards are significant that can lead into, to, into default and all of the problems that that brings for all of the parties, uh, for the SPV, for AMI, for the lenders and for, and for the council. And, and, and that is a, a very significant 
place to be and something that when evaluated alongside the reputational impact was was seen to be uh, important to protect against. Okay, you nevertheless decided to pull the plug on the 26th of March. Uh, we asked the council for um, to pause the works, and in conjunction, we agreed that that was what we were going to do. We didn't we didn't walk away and pull the plug. No, no. although Darren was clear it was his decision to do that. Uh, it was his instigation, I think, is, is what Darren's talking about. Okay. So we, we instigated the conversation, and we agreed that with the council. Okay. Okay. Um, It was also, uh, could you tell me what sort of view you took at the board or yourself as a CEO from the fact that um, in those two months period it was pretty clear that um, for all the escalation of the measures they weren't having the effect of being able to continue the programme on the, controversial, the most controversial streets. Uh, yeah, I mean the, the efforts... Um, from our side were, were not working, you know, the escalations weren't working and the subsequent you know, uh, attempts to make them work also weren't working. Okay. So we were making very limited, if any, progress um, on the work that needed to be done. Um, so you know, you eventually you kind of ran out of options and we had run out of options during that period. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, now, there's something else I wanted to ask you which um, goes to, I mean, I, I feel it's okay to ask you this because Amy Group's a shareholder in the SPV and you, yeah. there's, there's a staff member who is appointed to be a director of the SPV. Yeah. Um, and so I just wanted to ask what you can tell us about the reasons for the deficit currently held by the SPV, by Amy Hallam Highways Limited in its accounts um, and the implications um, for the future of the program, and if you're aware of any plans to address that, yeah, I mean, I'm, um, I've not studied the accounts of the um, of the SPV, um, and the SPV is you know responsibility to maintain um, a range of different bank accounts, so it can it can pay its obligations, in, in including uh, debt service repayments. As far as I'm aware, it's not it's, it's not failed to meet any of those right. obligations. Um, what, what I am aware of is that there was a refinance in 2016 and the swap um, or the breakage costs of that um, refinance would have hit the books yeah. of, um, of the SPV and that's potentially where that's come from. Yeah. I don't think we've got any reason um, to assume that the, um, that the SPV is not sustainable yeah. or, or over time it won't recover uh, that deficit. Very good, thank you very much. Um, different question. I wonder if there's anything you would like to tell me about your observation of the personal impact on Amy's staff of the dispute and what you can tell me about how the company tried to support people. Yeah, there's a, there's a particular one, a point I'd like to make, so I'm just going Please to, do. Just going to take, take my, um, uh, my note for this, if that's okay. Yeah. <coughs> um, I mean, this, this, is, this is a really unusual situation for an organisation like Amy, and, and the personal impact on our people was, was massive. Right. You know, it, it was really significant. People, people want to go to work to do the job, not to suffer abuse, um, right. and, and certainly not, uh, and not to feel maybe that there's safety is at risk. Um, and that abuse in some cases continued outside the workplace when people went home back into their own, their own um, communities. And many of our people live in Sheffield. So this is a, a hugely um, stressful time for everybody concerned. Um, we didn't force anybody to go to the controversial work sites. No, nobody, had, you know, nobody was putting under any kind of pressure to, to, to do that. Um, but people wanted to do what they thought was right. There was a huge amount of, um, uh, of commitment and, and therefore frustration. Um, safety is a, a huge paramount issue for, um, for Amy uh, and it was our biggest priority then and it will, I'm sure, remains our biggest priority, priority uh, now. Uh, we have um, a lot of things in place to support safety. There's a, a zero code, a zero harm tolerance, there's a, a well-being capability and a set of well-being tools and we deployed more people to support um, uh, the, the guys on the contract. Um, 
particularly around that sort of well-being and, and, and um, making sure everybody was aware and, and, and felt safe. We put further uh, security protocols in place mm -hmm. and undertook specific risk assessments. Um, but we, uh, the, the company, and I will say Darren Butt in particular, spent a huge amount of time talking to people, dealing with their concerns and really supporting them um, in this really, really difficult phase. Um, but regrettably people didn't want to remain in that environment and we did lose some, some really good people because it wasn't what they wanted to, to do with their career, they wanted to get on with their jobs. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, let's stand back and some years have passed. <coughs> <coughs> as you said at the beginning, you're now going to be reassuming some responsibilities for this. So I wanted to ask you um, what, with the benefit of hindsight, you think could have been done differently by whom and when? Sure. I mean, it really does come back to the same four points that I made at the, at the beginning. It's actually a really difficult question to answer um, easily because in the same circumstances, you could quite readily... Uh, end up locked into the same processes that we've um, found ourselves in today. But I think a lot of focus now could be on the specification and outcomes and the consideration of the soft estate in, in parity with the hard estate. And I think some, you know, some real thought could go into how you would specify works like this in the future so you get a, a kind of mix of benefit to the, all the assets. I'm not sure that would uh, obviate the need for any tree replacement, but mm -hmm. it, it potentially could significantly reduce right. uh, the number of trees um, uh, to, be, to be replaced. Uh, the second is this concept of look. I, I'm a big believer in PFI and project finance. I think without without these kind of structures, um, the UK infrastructure wouldn't be where it is today. And if you yeah. look forward, I've just spent quite a lot of time working with the institution of civil engineers to produce a, a paper on how engineers can support the development of models and project finance for um, net zero infrastructure. But there are challenges with PFI, you know, it's hugely expensive and time consuming to tender. Um, it does involve uh, 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 dealing with a, a lot of things which at the start can be unforeseen. Um, and so, and, and it is ultimately very inflexible. So I think building in a mechanism to introduce greater flexibility into PFIs is, is fundamental and maybe that's a job for uh, as I said earlier for lawyers but mm -hmm. I think organisations like Amy can uh, absolutely contribute to that um, and, and something that uh, Amy will be contributing to um, really critically I think a, a, a joint um, approach to risk assessment is, is fundamental to this right. and, and, a, and a really rigorous um, approach to that I, I guess we perhaps get a little bit um, um, comfortable with a set of risks which is standard across a range of different projects and actually really digging into the um, potential in local areas is, is, uh, is something which I think we should take uh, more seriously and engage more widely with and then, then work out where best to place that, that risk and build that into the overall uh, risk transfer. And in this case, and I think a lesson for Amy is the way in which the works are sequenced. And, and the impact of that sequencing and the um, follow-on or, or uh, um, pre uh, the, the leading communications that, that, that go with that and the impact of that and how you could then feed that, um, take the feedback from that communication back into the way that, that those words are sequenced. So they are the kind of four things I think that would make a, a big difference from the outset. I think mm -hmm. in, um, in contract, the, these things are very difficult to, um, to, to change. Okay. Um, again, you're reassuming some responsibilities. Yeah. The contract's got another 15 years to yeah. run. Do you have any kind of things you're thinking about, concerns or challenges for the future, or any thoughts on how the risks of similar problems re-emerging in future can be minimised? Um, I, think, I think it's really important that we see the benefits in these contracts and particularly move forward from this from this point you know so from my perspective this inquiry is, is really welcome because it, it, it kind of you know casts a light on uh, 
uh, on the events and, and the lessons that need to, need to be learned. Um, I think there's still quite a lot of work to be done um, and it's important that the um, collaboration that's in place now um, continues all the way through because there will still be you know, difficult areas to deal with and that will need a, a, you know, a wide approach. But I think that collaboration appears now to be in place and, and effective and if that can be maintained then I think this is, um, you know, this is, this is going to be a, a great contract with, with great outcomes for, um, for the city. And, it, and as I said at the beginning, it's a great place for Amy, Amy to be. You know, we want to rebuild our reputation now based on the outcomes uh, over, the next, um, over the next 15 years. Mm. You live in the city, you know the city very well. Yeah. You're, uh, I, so maybe I can just finally give you a chance to give your response to a question I asked Peter Anderson, um, which is about the benefits of having better um, roads and pavements and streetlights um, in the city. What, what does that bring to the city? I'm not just talking about the outputs, but I'm, talking, I'm, I'm, I'm inviting you to give a description of the outcomes or the, the wider benefits, if you like. Yeah. Um, well, I think that, you know, Sheffield's a, a, a major city in the, in the UK. Its infrastructure um, was behind that of um, its contemporaries. That is, makes it less attractive to, um, for, for businesses coming into the city, makes it a less attractive place to live. Um, the amenity provided by um, the highway and footway network is, is significant, and particularly as we've got an aging population. So making Sheffield a, a, a better and nicer place to live has significant benefits, but it also brings in uh, investment and, um, yeah, and trade, which I think is particularly important as, as we move into an era of hopefully levelling up and, and mm. bringing more significance to, to, to cities in the north. Um, and it's also looking at things like the benefit of the street lighting programme, we've now got a, a, a much lower baseline for energy yeah. and generally greater amenity throughout the city. So I, I think this contract brings significant huge benefits actually um, for, the, um, for, uh, for the city. And for Amy, you know, we've had a presence here for a very long time. This is a key strategic location for us. And although the PFI is difficult, being in the region is, is great. And being in the region contributing to the improvement of infrastructure in, in Sheffield and the surrounding area is something that you know, we feel really strongly about and are very proud of. Very good. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Uh, no, I think that's um, I, th I think that's everything. I mean, the, the sort of last point is is where I wanted to end. Uh, you know, I think there's a huge amount to be optimistic about moving forward. It's a very unfortunate event, looking looking backwards, um, and the examination of the reasons for, for that is you know is being done openly and transparently. But uh, but we want to we do want to move forward now and, and sort of realise all of the benefits for for Sheffield. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That, that completes the discussion. Great. So Charles, you can stop. Thanks.